So I am really excited to announce our keynote speaker. Uh, when I started a writing center seven years ago, I, Jen Wells was one of the first people that I was in contact with. Um, Jen is fabulous. She started, she'll tell you about it, but she started her high school writing center in San Francisco, California, Mercy High School. Um, and since then, she got her PhD at um, the Indiana University of Pennsylvania in composition studies, um, where then she moved from one sunny place, California, to another sunny place, Florida. Um, and she was the director of the Writing Center at Florida State University for two years before she headed um, to Sarasota, where she currently is the uh, composition director and oversees the Writing Center at the New College of Florida. She knows students. She works for students. She loves students. Um, she was a high school teacher first, um, and she is really excited and prepared to speak today, both to the tutors and uh, to the directors in the room. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce and welcome Dr. Jennifer Wells. All right, so um, just so I can get a sense of who is in the room, how many of you all are high school students? Yeah, okay, so I was a student for 25 years. Um, and I have sat through many uh, lectures, so I will try to make this as entertaining as I possibly can. Um, I tell pretty bad jokes, so just laugh for me. Um, so my speech today, or my talk today, uh, takes a cue from The Little Prince. Um, what is it? Invisible is essential to the eye. Beliefs, behavior, and the high school writing center. I'm gonna do this in four sections so you can kind of keep track and figure out like how long it is until you get to get up and walk away. So I started teaching when I was 21, so I was like five minutes older than my students. Um, and, um, and then I, I was asked to direct a high school, actually start a high school writing center from scratch. Um, at that time, there was one book that had, two books that had been published, one in the 70s, one more recently. Um, so I had two books, and it basically felt like putting IKEA furniture together from scratch in the dark. Um, I really didn't know what I was doing. I just threw a bunch of stuff at the wall, hoped it stuck, um, and, it, and luckily it did. So the Mercy High School Reading and Writing Center um, was focused both on developing writing, obviously, but also on reading. And so we did a lot of work on the Reading Writing Connection. Um, that's Esmeralda, our sofa. You probably can't see it, but it's a bright green sofa. Um, and I have some thoughts about space, but basically we created a welcoming, what I'm going to call a third space. So something that was part of learning, and learning occurred there, but it was very distinct from the classroom environment. Um, so after five years, we had a 90% usage rate. So 90% of our high school students, on their own free will, voluntarily came to our center. Um, and I think that speaks to the potential for high school writing centers to truly become the center of literacy at your particular school, and everything feeds into and out of that program. Um, I briefly, not briefly, I was at Florida State University, so I went from a high school of 500 students to a university of 40,000 students um, with a terrible football team this season. Uh, and then now I am at the director of writing at New College of Florida, and I want to talk a little bit about the school. Um, we are a publicly funded, so we were publicly funded by the state of Florida, and I think that they forget we exist. We're the honors college for the state. We're liberal arts. We have 900 students. We don't give grades. Um, our students don't wear shoes, and so we're very um, kind of out of the typical norm for university in Florida. Our students are very good at school when they get to us. They um, generally are very high achieving. The, the GPA range is 3.66 to 4.33. Um, when I was in high school, you couldn't even have more than a 4.0, so I don't really know how that works. 45% um, has taken AP Lit, Comp, or AP US History, but obviously many take multiple. As I'm sure, how many of you are in multiple APs right now? Yeah, okay, it's, that's a thing. Um, we have also 30% who have done some dual credit enrollment, which is a big thing in Florida, so they've taken some college classes as high school students. And then we have 17% who've come out of IB programs. Um, so they're very, so I'm gonna tell you the story about this picture with the, the feet here. Um, so I took my students, I had a class of 12 um, in my writing about writing class, and every semester I take them out to coffee one time. 
and I buy them all coffee, and we sit at the cafe, and we have our class there. So one day, I took 12 students, and I didn't think to look at their feet. Like I said, our students don't wear shoes, most of them, so I forgot that I should check their feet before I take them into a public um, dining establishment. So we get there, and lo and behold, uh, two of them are not wearing shoes, but the other 10 are. So I say, okay, I'm sorry, the two of you who are not wearing shoes, I can't um, not take the rest of everyone. I promise I will take you another time. I guess you just have a free day. And I thought that they would be like, woohoo, and like run away and go do something else. But I take my class into the coffee shop, we're there for an hour, um, and I come back out, and the coffee shop's in a museum, and the security guard says, is there a Dr. Wells here? And I'm just like, oh God, what happened? But <laughs> they do. Um, she's like, your students have many shoes. So my <laughs> students had found palm tree fronds and like sticks and um, some vines, and they had made shoes, and then they had asked the museum supervisor to come and verify that these were in fact shoes so they could come in and join their classmates. So our students are curious, they are academically entrepreneurial, they are driven, they're makers. If you're into maker culture, they make stuff. Um, and you know, they may not always have the social awareness to wear shoes, but they're very persistent. So everything about this says that these students should automatically be successful in college, right? They've come out of college prep programs at their high schools, they're high achieving, they're confident, they're creative, it has everything in place. So, you know, you think that they would be successful, but they don't all make it. And so I want to give you a minute to try to predict where I'm going with this. Um, here's your magic eight ball. What do you think? What would make students who are equally academically prepared, quote unquote, be more or less successful during our first year of college? So take a minute and just chat to the person next to you. What would make someone be successful if you had the same preparation? Your grades updated every five minutes 
to narrative <laughs> evaluation, so there's a lot of ambiguity. We don't have like a set curriculum in the sense that many schools have like a first year, second year, third year level. So there's a lot that students have to be flexible to do um, in order to be our, as successful at our school. <coughs> when they enter college, students must be prepared above all to adapt, and this is my emphasis, adapt to these new environments. So it's not like they can take what they learned in one place and exactly transfer it to a completely different context. It's just the direct transfer doesn't work. And, and you know, as someone who taught high school for 10 years and has been at the college level for six, I often feel like I go back and forth between the two groups. And I have some disgruntled um, faculty that I work with at the college level who say, you know, the students today are worse off than they ever were. And I'm like, well, that's what Plato said like thousands of years ago, so, you know, it's not new. Um, but really, a lot of the complaints are not so much about skills. Like, our students come in with strong skills. Obviously, they've done really well in high school and done well in AP tests. But it's not really about the lack of skills, but the ability to apply these skills in a new context. So again, when the context is so different from what they knew before, the transfer doesn't happen automatically. Um, so knowledge transfer, this is my nerdy part, right? I said nerdy for five minutes. The ability to take what is learned in one context and apply it successfully in another, possibly different context. Right? So this cat has learned that he can grab things with his paws, but then this doesn't work in this context because it's a ribbon, right? Um, so David Perkins and Gabrielle Solomon uh, said that education can achieve abundant transfer if it's designed to do so. So this isn't like a doom and gloom, you're all destined to suffer when you get to college or high school teachers, like what have you done with your lives? That's not my <laughs> point at all, um, obviously. But you do need to do some certain things. And so when I studied the students who graduated from our high school, again, it came down to their beliefs and behaviors. So if you think about transfer, knowledge transfer as a puzzle, there's lots of different pieces. You have the learner or the student, the instructional tasks, including the learning materials and practice problems, the stuff you get in class, the instructional context, so just the setting of the school, the high school that you're in, the sort of behavior of other students, the norms and expectations that come with your particular institution, all of this will affect your transfer. Then the transfer task, the thing you're trying to do, where you're trying to take knowledge from previous learning and apply it to current learning, and then that context. And so, um, a lot of what I thought I would find, again, is that the instructional tasks or, or learning materials were what, the curriculum or what, facilitated the, the transfer and actually had to do with the learner. So even if the learner has acquired all of the resources necessary for a particular transfer task, so even if they've done everything right, they've learned all the things, they've passed all the tests, if they cannot easily access those resources, so if they cannot be metacognitive and reflect back on what they have learned, if they can't recognize the relevance of the prior learning to the past learning, so if they're like, they don't see there's a connection between the thing they're being asked to do now and what they learned before, or they don't have any desire to transfer their knowledge, they're like not motivated, then it's not gonna happen. So again, it's not cognitive, it's really about the learner's dispositions. Um, and so they have declarative knowledge, so if you think about this with writing, um, you've got content knowledge, which is knowing math. So if you know that a topic sentence is the first one in a paragraph, you've got declarative knowledge. You have procedural knowledge, which is you know how. So you know how to revise a topic sentence to fit that paragraph. But then you need to also have dispositions, which are beliefs and attitudes that influence a learner's actions. Example, a learner is motivated, so they persist to keep on revising. So you can have the procedural knowledge and you can have the declarative knowledge, but you have to have the dispositions to enact that knowledge. There's my folks. Okay, so let me talk about a couple of key beliefs. So expectancy value theory, which is a fancy way of saying, like how many of you have sat students and people who used to be students, sat in, or professors who went to professional development, sat in a workshop and said, how am I ever gonna use this thing? This has nothing to do with my life or it's not relevant to my interests. Is this, has this ever occurred to anybody? Yeah. yeah, okay. So obviously, if you're sitting here and you're like, I have no 
idea of how this is useful, I'm sure it's actually not useful, then you're not motivated to really learn it in the first place. You do what you need to do to get through, but you're not absorbing it. Um, and so when students don't really have a sense of where they will transfer their knowledge down the road, they are unlikely to transfer it at all. And that really comes in with writing. Students often don't understand, like, okay, they've written X, Y, and Z genres, but they don't quite know, like, where down the road in college or even in life. I have a lot of students who are majoring in computer science who think that, well, as a first year they think this and we fix them quickly, but they think that there is not much writing in computer science, especially if you get a career as a software developer. Well, I can tell you, um, having grown up in San Francisco, that most of the people that have high positions in software, like our chief technology officers, have backgrounds in humanities because they can write and communicate well. You have to be able, if you're a computer science major, you have to be able to write about technical things but then explain them to someone who doesn't know anything about what you're talking about. Um, and so, again, if the students don't think writing is important to them, they're not going to really care to learn it in the first place. Okay, self-efficacy um, are students' beliefs about their capabilities to produce performances. So the example that I like to use is um, I hate to run, but I keep signing up for races, um, thinking that I will be motivated. So if I thought that it didn't matter what I did, it didn't matter what training I did or what nutrition I followed, that I would no way pass that finish line, then of course I would not be motivated to train or eat well or stay hydrated, right? But if I think, you know, I really hate this, and I'm actually not very naturally good at it, but if I put in the time and I run mile after mile, eventually I will run enough miles to get my medal, and then I will say I'll never do it again, and then the next day I'll sign up for another race, right? So your belief in your abilities um, impacts whether or not you do the things you need to do to be successful. So students with high self-efficacy are more likely than students with low self-efficacy efficacy to self-regulate their own learning, to work hard, and to be persistent. So obviously if you think you're not going to finish, why would you keep trying? There's no point. Um, students with low self-efficacy may perceive work to be harder than it actually is, um, which can cause negative emotions such as stress and depression. And I see this. I tutored two high school twi twins. They just started college this year. I started tutoring them when they were in sixth grade, and they both struggled with issues of confidence. And because they were so down on their own abilities, even the simplest assignment that they had done 20 times before, it was like A, new to them, and B, the worst thing they had ever seen because they thought it was gonna be so hard. And I'm like, Anna and Mary, you've done this a million times. But their beliefs about themselves impacted their ability to perceive the assignment accurately. All right, attribution theory is, um, when a student believes their ability or efforts are the cause of their success or failure, or that external forces are the cause of their success or failure. I really like this one. Um, so this cat is either really good at knowing where things are or just got really lucky. So either this cat has an internal locus of control, meaning they knew that they could influence their outcomes, or they have an external locus of control, meaning the fates decided that this surfboard was going to be here for them to cross the pool. And so students often, and teachers you will recognize this, and students you've probably said it, this teacher hates me. They are out to get me. They just do not, like, it does not matter what I do, this teacher is out to get me. And, you know, sometimes that's true, but most of the time, <laughs> but most of the time it's not, right? So a student who is always blaming everything else in their life or their performance has an external locus of control. Other entities are responsible for what they're able to do. On the other hand, an inter a student with internal locus of control thinks that it is up to them. But this can be bad also. If a student has an extremely high internal locus of control and they don't do well on an assignment, and we see this particularly with college freshmen who have done extremely well through high school, and then maybe get a C on their first writing assignment, and it's like their identity, and I'm serious, this sounds hyperbolic, but their identity is in question, right? Because they have worked so hard and they have done everything that they could do, 
And if they are not successful, it must reflect somewhere on them. So these attributions are really critically important and it's important to have a healthy balance. So what does this have to do with the High School Writing Center? Well, I'm gonna be making the argument that a High School Writing Center is probably, no, I'm not even gonna say probably, is the single best place for students to develop healthy dispositions while they're in high school with regards to their reading and writing. And it can do things that classroom teachers just cannot do because of time and the number of students we have in our classrooms. I had 150 students when I taught high school. As much as I wanted to meet with them individually every day after school, all day long, like you just can't. You know, you cannot give each student the one-on-one -on -one time. And when it comes to beliefs, that one-on-one -on -one time is what students need. So going back to expectancy value theory, students will perform better when they believe that they are capable of what they are working on. So peer tutors are really the best people to say, sophomore, you're working on this writing assignment, you're developing a thesis statement, well guess what, next year in so-and-so's class, this is all they do. So like the peer tutor has that insider knowledge. Is this true, peer tutors? Are you able to convince students, like no, really, this is important because we're gonna use it in this other class, right? You know more than anybody else where that student is gonna use that stuff later on in their high school career. Um, peer tutors can be taught and your directors can teach you how to prompt students to think like okay you're relating this now where might you use this down the road and this is what I do with my students in my classroom I'm always saying think about where you could use this um, because if they know where they're going they're gonna be able to take it with them peer tutors can also talk with students um, just generally like peer tutors you all talk about okay what are you interested in? what else is going on you know more about their lives outside of school, their activities. You can help them see how these things are valuable in other places. Um, and lastly, you can also, and I train our, our tutors at New College to do this, um, we have different tools for people that are internally motivated. There's a tool called Written Kitten. Has anyone seen this? Written Kitten, um, it, every 500 words you write, it gives you a new picture of a kitten from the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so our tutors know this. And they know to ask students about motivation, and they're saying, "Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm really motivated by like external rewards." Well, here's a kitten website, right? Here's a kitten generating website. Or for students who need kind of like I don't want to say punishment, but who maybe maybe need some negative reinforcement, there's another tool called Write or Die. Anyone heard of this? Okay, so Write or Die. It basically you set it for I want to be able to write X number of words, and I don't want to stop. So this is good for students who just need to generate stuff on the page and are afraid of the blank page. And the regular mode is if you stop writing for more than a minute, it just gives you like an annoying sound. Um, the next level, it gives you a scary picture of like a spider. Um, <laughs> and then the third level, a kamikaze level, is it starts to delete your work. <laughs> right. <laughs> Again, your peer tutors are on the front lines and they are the ones who are going to be able to help students connect the knowledge that you're trying to teach them, you teachers who are trying to teach them, with what they need to know down the road. And they're also the ones who are going to be able to give students, not only tell them about tools, but sit there while they actually try out written kitten or write or die. Okay, self-efficacy, students' beliefs about their capabilities to produce performances. That's really jargony, but anyway. Um, obviously, tutors, this is what you do more than anything else. And the reason I think this is, students who have low confidence or low self-efficacy, it's all about the small victories, right? It's not about did they get an A on their paper, it's about did they get three sentences down when the day before they got nothing done. And when you begin to celebrate small victories with your students, or when you're tutoring with your two Ts, those small victories are what increase self-efficacy. So you start small and you build up and that takes time and that's why the High School Writing Center is the place for that to occur. For a student with low self-efficacy, they often need to have an experience of success. Um, even strong, competent writers, like our students at New College, again, very confident, they are crippled with anxiety. They have what I call perfectionism paralysis where they um, are so afraid of getting something wrong or having their first draft not be perfect 
that they will just sit there and not do it at all. And it's not that they're procrastinating, and it's not that they're a bad student. Their identity is so wrapped up in their performance, they literally cannot start. So the Writing Center for those students becomes indispensable because we help students break that down, break it down. You can write a crappy first draft, that there's another word for it, if you read that article by Anne Lamott, but you can write a bad first draft and that is not only okay, that is actually a good thing because at least it gets you out of your head and onto the page. Um, and the last thing is that there are a couple of researchers who found that developing writers don't, and teachers, you know this, don't use all of the resources that are available to them, right? You have this after school hour, this worksheet, this support group, all this stuff. They don't use it. Why? Because they don't have any reason to. If they don't think it's going to matter, why would they try? So again, I'm saying that the Writing Center, if, especially if you require all of your students to use the Writing Center, which is a controversial sort of proposition, I am totally on that side. I don't think you should ever require four bad, quote unquote, bad writers to use the center. The center is for everybody. Obviously, it's for your high achieving students as well as those who are struggling. If you require them all to go, they will all have that experience and they will understand what it feels like to be successful. And when they have that experience, they will continue to seek out that resource. And I will also say, just as a side note, that resource seeking behavior transfers. The students who use the Writing Center at our high school were significantly, like statistically significantly more likely to go to their professor's office hours in college, to meet with their TA, and to use their Writing Center than the ones who did not use it. So that help-seeking behavior, you have got to get that developed as students are in high school. And that's one thing that's so advantageous when they go to college. And then lastly, attribution theory. When a student believes their ability or efforts are the cause or success of their failure. So how many of you have heard this or said it yourself? I am just not good at writing. Like, it's an innate, it's innate, I'm just not good. Nothing I ever do will make me good. Um, I don't have time to write. And I know high school students today, y'all are ridiculous with your schedules. Like it makes me tired just talking to some of you like, well, I have this after, and I go to dance, and then I have my internship, and then I do this, and I come out, and I'm like, but 12.30 at night, I start my homework, I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm asleep by 12.30. Um, uh, my teacher hates me. If I don't get a grade that reflects bad, if I don't get a good grade that reflects badly on me as a person, again, peer tutors, you are the ones who can work with your student no, you're not just not good at writing, you are good at writing. You just have to figure out what you need to do, the steps you need to take, the resources you need, the written kitten that you need to use to get there. So again, I want to conclude with my argument, and I, I really can't understate this enough, that a high school writing center should not just be a thing that's available after school. It is not an accessory for a high performance a high achieving or a high performing school. It's not a boutique luxury, it's not an add-on, it's not a bonus, it's not just one teacher's passion that they start it and then they leave for another school and it goes away. It can be all of those things, but what it should be is the center of that high school's universe. That writing center will help students improve their dispositions, create healthier dispositions, which we know from research will influence their ability to successfully transfer knowledge from high school to college, high school to the career, high school to the workplace. So the Writing Center is, in my opinion, not optional. It should be central to your high school's curriculum. And that's because it's very simple. It is only with the heart that one can see rightly what is essential is invisible to the eye. Thank you so much. Jen a much more robust and less polite applause. She said exactly what I think all of us needed to hear and she set a really good tone for what we um, have in store for us. For